It is a great pleasure to contribute to this symposium on the 40th anniversary of the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. Thanks to Marty Downs and Frank Davis for organizing this symposium to mark this occasion for the network. My name is Forrest Isbell. I'm the Associate Director at Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve and an Associate Professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. In this talk, I'll explore how long-term studies reveal otherwise hidden roles of biodiversity and species identity in regulating ecosystem functioning. I'll draw heavily upon the wonderful examples that were included in the recent LTR Decadal Review document. First, I'll consider effects of species identity. Then I'll consider effects of species uh, diversity, some of which are related to those effects of species identity, others of which can be separated from them. Finally, I'll talk about some exciting future directions for this research. For centuries, dating back to at least the early 1600s, chemists and biologists studied how plant biomass production depends on abiotic factors such as water, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and nutrients. By the late 1900s, it was becoming increasingly clear that primary productivity and nutrient cycling also strongly depend on plant species identities. For example, a seminal paper by Sarah Hobby published in Tree in 1992 described how plant species found in nutrient poor ecosystems often tend to grow slowly, use nutrients efficiently, and produce poor quality litter that decomposes slowly and deters herbivores. In contrast, many of the plant species growing in nutrient rich environments grow quickly, produce readily degradable litter, sustain high rates of herbivory. Thus, depending on which types of plant species are present, rates of nutrient cycling may slow down or speed up. In other words, ecosystem processes depend not only on abiotic factors studied for centuries, but also on which species of plants are living in a particular environment and how they regulate energy flows and nutrient cycling. Throughout the 40-year history of the LTR network, research at many sites has rigorously explored how particular species or types of species alter ecosystem functioning and services. LTR researchers at ecosystems as diverse as the Santa Barbara Coastal, Virginia Coastal Reserve, and Harvard Forest are testing the hypothesis that individual species, such as giant kelp, seagrasses, and hemlock trees, can be foundation species in the ecosystem, creating fundamentally different abiotic and biotic conditions than would exist without them. For example, this picture from Harvard Forest shows the canopy of hemlock trees that were girdled to simulate the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid and understand how the loss of this tree species will alter these forests. Furthermore, in the grasslands of the Kanza Prairie, researchers have discovered the keystone roles of bison. And in the alpine tundra at Niwot Ridge, plant species differences in tissue chemistry can alter rates of soil carbon and nutrient cycling. Together, these results indicate the importance of accounting for species identities, including their trophic level and their functional traits when understanding and predicting ecosystem processes. By the early 1990s, there was also growing interest in understanding the consequences of biodiversity loss. It was clear that climate change and nutrient pollution could alter ecosystem functioning, but it was still unclear how concurrent changes in biodiversity might also alter ecosystem functioning. Ecologists came together in Germany to develop hypotheses for what might happen. They literally drew lines on a chalkboard sketching out several possibilities. One possibility was that each species loss would lead to an incremental decline in ecosystem functioning. This might be the case, for example, if each species was unique and contributed equally to ecosystem functioning. A more popular hypothesis among ecologists surveyed in the late 1990s was the river redundancy hypothesis. This notion was that just like an airplane, airplane might be able to continue to fly for a while as it loses rivets, maybe ecosystems could do the same as they lost species. The idea was that just as some rivets are redundant, they're not all needed to keep the airplane's wing attached, for example, species might also be somewhat functionally redundant. In particular, if there are many functionally similar species, then perhaps ecosystem functioning would only decrease when the last species of a functional group or type goes extinct. Other ecologists hypothesized the opposite though, that the first few species extinctions might have the biggest impact on ecosystem functioning because some of the species going extinct first were top predators and other species known to strongly regulate ecosystem processes. 
These lines on a chalkboard were a decent starting point, but more rigorous empirical and theoretical studies were needed to test these ideas. Two high-profile early studies were published in Nature in 1994. One of these studies, Dave Tillman and John Downing, found that diverse plant communities lost less productivity during a drought and more fully recovered productivity shortly after a drought when compared to species poor to pauper at plant communities. This was based on a reanalysis of data from a fertilization experiment at Cedar Creek. In the other paper, Shahid Naeem and others reported that biodiversity loss could reduce several ecosystem functions including primary productivity. This was based on a microcosm experiment that manipulated diversity within multiple trophic levels of a food web. Both studies were quickly criticized, though, for having confounded species identity with species richness. The diversity gradient in the fertilization study was the result of fertilization. Heavily fertilized communities had low plant diversity and different types of species than those in the high diversity communities. The food web experiment had considered nested subsets of a full food web, and thus it was unclear whether the observed changes in ecosystem functioning were due to decreases in the number of species per se, or rather the loss of a particularly critical species. This posed a new challenge for biodiversity and ecosystem functioning research. Were biodiversity effects different from species identity effects, or were they really just one and the same? Initially, this confounding of species richness and identity effects was presented in a, as a statistical issue. At high levels of species richness, there's a greater probability of including a highly productive species. Thus, perhaps species loss led to declining productivity or resistance to drought simply because there was a reduced chance of including the most productive species or drought resistant species when fewer species were sampled in a species poor community. These so-called sampling effects were initially posed as a problem for these early studies. Maybe diversity effects were not something new and separate from identity effects, which were already rigorously being investigated. However, early theoretical work instead showed that sampling effects could be thought of as the outcome of a special case of resource competition theory. Specifically, if there's competition for a single limiting resource in a homogeneous environment, if the species pool contains species that only differ in their R star values, then the best competitor, the one with the lowest R star, eventually outcompetes all the other species. Superior resource competitors produce more biomass because they obtain more of the limiting resource. In this case, there can be positive effects of original species richness on plant biomass and negative effects of original plant species richness on resource levels. Although the communities begin with any number of species, they all end up with only one species, the single best competitor. Subsequent theoretical work argued that these should be called selection effects rather than sampling effects, given that they were necessarily the outcome of species interactions rather than merely a statistical sampling process. That is, although there is a greater probability of including a highly productive species at high levels of diversity, there's also a greater probability of including the least productive species at high levels of diversity. For there to be a diversity effect, as shown here, the most productive species must systematically outcompete the least productive species in the diverse communities. Early theoretical work also showed that biodiversity effects could also arise from complementarity effects, which were separate from species identity effects. For example, if there's competition for two resources, and if species exhibit a trade-off for the two essential resources, and if there's a heterogeneous environment with different ratios of these two resources, then a species is competitively superior at some but not all ratios. Thus, the two species can coexist, including at different places in this heterogeneous environment. Additional species can invade, further decrease resource concentrations, and increase biomass if they can exploit unconsumed resources. This early theoretical work showed that both species identity and biodiversity per se can simultaneously influence ecosystem functioning. Shortly thereafter, Leroux and Hector developed a method for estimating the relative magnitudes of selection and complementarity effects. Since then, it has become clear that diversity effects are often explained by complementarity effects and to a lesser extent by selection effects. Also in the late 1990s, Shigi Oyashi and Michel Rowe and others developed the temporal and spatial insurance hypotheses, which provided mechanisms by which temporal and spatial beta diversity could alter ecosystem functioning. Insurance effects of diversity 
both enhance the temporal mean and reduce the temporal variance of ecosystem productivity in diverse communities. This occurs because species have asynchronous responses to environmental fluctuations and species come to dominate mixtures when and where they're most productive. These are really just selection effects, but ones in which different species are selected for during different years or at different places. We recently showed that these effects of spatial and temporal beta diversity can be quantified by partitioning the selection effect across space and time. Beginning in the mid-1990s, a new generation of biodiversity experiments emerged at LTER sites and worldwide. The first large-scale biodiversity field experiment was established at Cedar Creek by Dave Tillman in 1994. It remains an active study, making it the world's longest-running biodiversity experiment. Its design helped decouple species identity effects from species richness effects. Specifically, by randomly sampling both the level of species richness and the species to be included in each experimental plot, an experimental gradient of diversity was created without systematically changing which species were included at higher low levels of diversity. There was an equal probability of including any particular species in any particular plot, regardless of its level of species richness. Results from this experiment have shown that mixtures planted with 16 grassland plant species produce about three times as much above ground biomass as the average monoculture, have about twice as much weed suppression, about 40% greater ecosystem stability and soil carbon accumulation on an annual basis, and about 25% more soil nitrogen accumulation on an annual basis. Other experiments with similar designs have been conducted in grasslands across Europe, in forests worldwide, and in many other freshwater marine and terrestrial ecosystems worldwide. A meta-analysis of results from these studies found that short-term experimental uh, results were largely consistent across 327 experiments that manipulated the diversity of primary producers. Losing about one in four species causes loss of about four to 10 percent of primary producer biomass. The shape of this curve is largely consistent with the rivet redundancy hypothesis. However, in 2011, we found that different sets of species promoted ecosystem functioning during different years, at different places, for different ecosystem functions, and under different global change scenarios. Thus, although we found that only about one third of the species significantly increased ecosystem functioning when considering a single function at one time in one place under current conditions, we found that 84% of the 147 species studied in these experiments promoted at least one ecosystem function under at least some conditions. Furthermore, in 2012, Peter Reich led a study that showed that the River redundancy curves turned into more linear relationships over time in the two longest running biodiversity experiments in the world. Thus, during the early years of these experiments, one of which is shown here, it appeared that the loss of a few species from a high diversity community would have little impact on the yield. Whereas in the later years of the study, it became clear that even a loss of a few species from a high diversity grassland could lead to substantial loss of yield. Results like this require long-term support for long-term studies, as well as smart people like Peter. However, plant diversity loss doesn't always decrease productivity. For example, Mindy Smith and Alan Knapp conducted a nice experiment at Conza Prairie where they showed that dominant species such as big blue stem can maintain high levels of productivity even if subordinate species were removed. This study rigorously showed that it matters which species are lost. These results from Kanza are consistent with another study led by Andy Hector, which found across many biodiversity experiments that productivity depends about as much on changes in richness that are independent of changes in species identity as it does on changes in species composition or identity that are independent of species richness. In other words, randomly adding or subtracting a species influences productivity about as much as randomly changing species composition within a level of species richness. Given this, species loss has very different impacts if the species being lost are highly productive in dominant species or much less productive in subordinate species. In another cross-site synthesis of many biodiversity experiments, we found that biodiversity often increases ecosystem stability, mostly because it increases resistance to climate events. 
This was true regardless of whether the climate events were wet or dry, moderate or extreme, and brief or prolonged. We did not, however, find that biodiversity consistently promoted the recovery of productivity after climate events. Instead, productivity recovered rather quickly, regardless of whether plant communities had high or low diversity. At KBS, a row crop experiment found that maize yields in the highest diversity mixture of crops and cover crops were twice that in a continuous monoculture, and that crop diversity could be used as a substitute for chemical inputs. A more recent paper from this experiment showed that crop diversity also enhanced soil microbial diversity, leading to increased soil organic matter and fertility. I must admit that the picture shown here is actually of a different experiment at KBS, but it was so gorgeous that I couldn't resist using it. Um, the citations shown here are correct, however. Recent studies have also gone back to naturally assembled ecosystems, finding results similar to the experimental results in the Newtnet grasslands and in forest inventories for the studies shown here. There are also networks of observational studies that have been conducted worldwide in drylands, um, marine ecosystems, and freshwater ecosystems. It's reassuring uh, that these studies are, are finding results that are consistent with, with what's been found in the experiments because the truth likely resides at the intersection of theory, experiments, and observations. But I must admit that we still don't know how global extinctions will alter global ecosystem functioning. Uh, we've expanded out from experiments to networks of experiments and networks of observations, but at best, this helps determine the generality of the local scale processes studied in local experiments and observational studies. There are dispersal and other processes arising at larger spatial scales that we cannot fully consider in our, our local empirical studies. Two recent LTR synthesis working groups have made some progress on addressing this knowledge gap. Uh, Kim Kamatsu, Megan Avolio, and Kevin Wilcox have led one group that has integrated plant community and ecosystem responses to global change drivers and accounted for communities and global models. In a second LTR synthesis working group, which I've co-led with Jane Coles and Laura D, we've made some progress on scaling up productivity responses to changes in biodiversity. For example, as I mentioned earlier, we found a way to quantify selection effects that arise across space and time due to beta diversity that arises from selection for different species at different places or different times. There's been a flurry of recent papers considering effects of spatial and temporal beta diversity on ecosystem functioning and also considering larger spatial extents, including some exciting remote sensing work. I hear of many exciting remote sensing projects at many LTER sites, and I suspect this will increasingly become a strength of the network in the coming years. I'll conclude by reiterating that selection effects can be considered identity effects of dominant species. Complementarity effects are also common. They're not identity effects, and they can reinforce or counterbalance identity effects depending on which species are being selected for and which ones are being lost. Additional effects of biodiversity can arise at larger scales when beta diversity arises from selection for different species at different places or times. Thus, even when selection effects are important, diversity can also be important, though likely at larger spatial scales or longer temporal scales. I'd like to acknowledge the many researchers across the LTR network for providing the insights I've tried to highlight here in this very short talk. Um, I also acknowledge support from NSF through the LTER program, for which I'm very grateful.